Hello, everyone. Welcome to another binary episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre with me is Z. Today, we have an iOS parser vuln detailed by Project Zero, a PHP memory corruption, and a bit of a discussion around the future of bugs and security that spawned from our Discord. Um, before that, though, Z will get into the spot the vuln solution for this week, as always, and I'll let him take that away. Yeah, so this week's spot the vuln um, spotted fairly quickly and I mean, if you're familiar with crypto attacks, hopefully it's not, or hopefully you were able to spot this one. Uh, basically, the issue here, you've got this verify receive data, just taking a data and an HMAC key. This time it is properly calculating an HMAC. Um, uh, it splits the payload into either the payload itself or the received HMAC. Um, does a little check there uh, uh, before just to make sure length is... Uh, at least 32. That's really just so it doesn't give an out-of-bounds index error when it actually does this split. Uh, calculates the proper HMAC. And then at the very end, you've got the three lines there iterating over uh, for the length of the calculated HMAC. Um, comparing each byte of the received HMAC with what's actually calculated for the uh, payload that was sent in. Um, iterates over that as soon as it hits a character that's bad, returns false. So, pretty classic attack there. You've got a timing attack. Um, an attacker could abuse this along with, um, if they were able to figure out the timings, uh, basically just uh, or figure out the proper HMAC one character at a time, brute forcing it until it takes slightly longer, and just seeing the timing difference of each iteration. Um, over the internet, it is a little bit of a challenge to do these sort of timing attacks, especially where it is a very subtle timing difference. However, across, you know, thousands of requests, there have been a number of uh, kind of academic research papers done on this idea of timing attacks across the internet. So there is some reason to do it or some possibility of it, um, especially if you're able to do it across a lot of different requests. But yeah, it is kind of a classic crypto issue. These sorts of timing issues, you should be doing a constant time, um, a constant time sort of comparison here. So I think classically, you probably just XOR it and, you know, you should end with zero uh, would be one way of doing that. I'm sure there's probably a better way of going about that now, too. Uh, but yeah, going for a timing attack. Yeah, and I've always loved those those crypto side channel type vulnerabilities because whenever you have vulns that uh, start to creep into crypto, it's just uh, yeah, they're they're really cool bugs and they're not something that's immediately obvious when you read the code. If you just read this without thinking about the timing, uh, the fact that the timing can be measured in mind, like it, it's just not really something that's going to scream out to you. So yeah, cool cool challenge. So yeah, we'll get into our first uh, topic here on on real vulnerabilities that have been found recently. Um, and this is a Project Zero post that details a vuln reported by uh, Zerub. Very subtle bug and lots of background detail, uh, which I'll let Z get into here. Yeah, like I said, it is a subtle bug. A um, lot of background kind of need to get it that I'm not going to go through as usual Project Zero post. There's a lot of detail here. There's also a frack article about this vulnerability, you can go for a little bit more information on it. Uh, but they bring up, basically, they had a diff here to kind of help them figure out what the issue was. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but starting off, it's dealing with abstract syntax notation 1, or ASN 1. Effectively, it's a sort of type length value serialization format, so, you know, you provide the type, you provide the length, and you provide all the data that's going to be interpreted as that type. Oh, you've got primitive types, so that's like your byte array would be a primitive type. You would just say like, in the type, you'd indicate it's a string, character array, whatever, give it how many bytes it is, and it's just going to read the next X bytes as that type, and it can directly interpret it as that type. There's nothing special needed. You've got the complex types, so you can nest all of these. Your type can actually be, or sorry, the values in there can actually be another TLV or ASN1 encoded piece of data. Um, and so where things get interesting here is there's no sort of compression, there's no expansion type of system. So basically, they abuse that and get rid of a lot of the uh, bounds checking in this code. Most of the code doesn't actually check the boundaries because in theory, if you allocate um, 
if you allocate a buffer that is the entire size of the ASN1 encoded buffer, the output of that uh, should never be larger than the input because it's removing metadata. It's writing in new, like it's writing in what it's decoding, but it's never adding new information. So it's going to be less than what it's received. There's a bit of a complex thing where it's going like, is this valid? And checking sizes at certain points to make sure it's not accessing a size that's like too large for uh, what its parent was and stuff. So it kind of walks up the tree looking for that. Some complicated parsing in, or parsing rules in there. But suffice it to say, you can have basically these complex types that are made up of these subtypes. And where we, where we have this particular vulnerability is in a specific type, which is the bitch string. Uh, bitch strings are a little bit special because in addition to having, um, so I will say, like, I am leaving out a few details, but you basically have one byte for the type. One byte, that gives you kind of the length of how many bytes more to read to actually parse whatever that type is. It is a bit more complex than that, um, and it can handle larger encodings that go beyond what the one byte can hold, so there's more to it. But uh, for the bit string, it's also a little bit special because after the length, there's actually one more byte. Say you have a 9-bit wide bit string. Well, that next byte is actually going to indicate, like, hey, there are seven bits in the last byte to be ignored. It's going to be the count of the number of bits to be ignored. That detail doesn't matter, but it's different because its length there is going to be uh, basically the actual number of, well, bits, or however many bytes holds bits, um, plus one because it has to store that extra one. So earlier on, they do some checking for, like, these empty objects where it's like, hey, I've got a bit string. Oh, actually, her. Not a bit string. Hey, I've got a string, and oh, actually, it's zero length, so there's nothing here. It does some checking, kind of short circuits the parser to skip ahead and just move to the next thing when it sees that. It can't do that with the bit string, so they had this code to kind of handle bit string where content length equals one. They'll do that check, and then this is when they're parsing the bit string. So they see, hey, I've got a bit string. Oh, content length is one. Therefore, this is one of those empty bit strings. And it takes this action um, where it will set the item that's supposed to be writing to. So this is the buffer that was allocated earlier uh, that's supposed to be long enough for the entire object. Uh, just sets that to null, sets length equal to zero. Kind of makes sense. I mean, it's nulling it and setting it to zero. If you're just looking at this code, fine. Like, you actually have a zero length bit string. There's nothing here. So that does make sense, but... Uh, one, that data pointer is actually supposed to be longer lived. So if this is a substring, so say you've got a bit string made up of like five or ten sub bit strings. So like I said, you can have these complex objects that are made up of subtypes. Um, if you have that, this is nulling the buffer to that. So like this really, it is a bug. It's just a little bit weird for it to have actually been hit. Um, so it shouldn't actually be nulling that. So that is kind of the giveaway here. Although, as the author states... Unless you really know a lot about all the parsing and stuff, you wouldn't recognize that as actually being an issue. Uh, so anyway, you end up in this case where it just sets that to null length zero. So what, are you going to get no pointer dereference? Not quite, because data being null and length zero is actually a, a separate edge case elsewhere in the code that kind of signals something else. Um. One thing that ASN1 supports is what if you don't know the full length of whatever you're providing? So it's like streaming data. You just tell it to start parsing it, it's going to figure out the length later. In that case, instead of allocating this one big buffer for everything, um, because it knows the size ahead of time, it's going to, or it's going to start this linked list, and for every sub-item, it's going to allocate it, because that will have the fixed size. So um, it'll allocate this uh, linked list, and then just every sub-item it'll allocate a new buffer. So if I can find the code for that. Um, long enough post. That, uh, takes a bit of time to scroll through everything. Uh, come down here where if it's dealing with a substring, it looks like, hey, is the item, or is the data buffer equal to null? And it does an assertion for length equals zero. If it is, it starts using... Um, 
it, it uses up the pool, but effectively it's just going to create this new buffer for the um for this type because what it's expecting is well this is a temporary buffer that's being used just for parsing this one subtype. Um and ultimately elsewhere it ends up assigning that uh uh the buffer into the data just for that item and so it creates this separate data that's only sized for the one item. So now when the next item comes along because it um it still thinks it's inside of this definite size thing even though the data buffer um, allow me to back up slightly. In the attack scenario, uh, so to abuse this, you have this edge case where null is actually indicating something completely different. So imagine the scenario you have a large string, or a large bit string. It allocates a buffer for it, does the normal thing, gets into this first substring. That first substring um, is just one of these zero length ones. So it's a bit of a bug there, and it ends up setting data to null. Then, when it goes to start parsing the second substring, it's going to hit this case where item data um, is equal to null. It's going to be like, hey, this is null. Oh, this is our special case indicating we need to allocate a new buffer just for this. And so it's going to do that. And then when it reaches the third one, it's going to be like, hey, okay, data or item data isn't null anymore. We've got a buffer here, so let's keep writing to it. Um, and it's going to basically write out a bounds on that buffer because it was allocated incorrectly or well reallocated technically incorrectly for that second buffer or for the for that second substring allowing you to kind of create this out of bounds right with it i'm sorry if you couldn't follow that through audio it is a bit of a complex bug i think it's a really cool subtle bug though just in how it messes basically with the internal state and really comes down to one area of code treating this data buffer being set to null as something special, and another area just not really recognizing that it has that special meaning besides just being an empty string, which it technically is at that point. Um, yeah, the main oh. takeaway there is just the fact that because you can trigger this edge case, you can get the buffer reallocated erroneously. Um, that's basically what it boils down to. How it gets there, though, is obviously like pretty complex, <laughs> as he was, was getting through there. Um, there are some diagrams in the post that kind of illustrate um, the attack scenario that he was talking about. Like, there's a, I think I jumped to it at some point, but yeah, they have this diagram that shows like the entire string and then the substrings that make it up that allow this scenario to take place. Um, but it's one of those things where unless you are you are keeping the context of the parsing uh, completely, like you're you're considering everything when you're reading the code, it's not really going to jump out at you. Um, this feels like a bug that you would kind of have to encounter by accident and then root cause after the fact. Because, yeah, like missing this in code review would be so, so easy. And I, I know for a fact I wouldn't have caught this yeah, um, I, if I was auditing similar code. The author here mentions the same thing. Like, they're not sure they would have caught it in a code review. They might have just gone for something easier. Um, yeah, I think I might have given up before I figured it out and gone to look uh, for something easier. Um, they do talk a little bit, just briefly, about, you know, why didn't fuzzing catch this? Um, and they kind of catch on either, perhaps this isn't being fussed, so this is in Apple security framework, it's in their specific fork of the NSS, uh, from Mozilla library, um, they don't have this in, like, upstream, and then they also mentioned because it is using, uh, a custom heap allocator, you know, you might not pick it up with ASAN or something like that, at least not without tweaking it to actually recognize there or an allocator ASAN will work with. There are a few reasons for that. It doesn't seem impossible that it wasn't caught with buzzing. I almost feel like it's possible that it is just the case that it wasn't really um like people were fuzzing NSS for sure. Maybe not so much the Apple one, not catching the difference between the two or seeing the difference as significant enough to fuzz. That does feel, at least that feels like a viable reason for me. And um, this, like, this is also one of those scenarios where you need kind of a complex input to trigger it. Um, you need, like, or at least to trigger it in a way that you can detect. 
Uh, I think that's probably a pretty like big well, consideration there. You only is the really fact need... that you have to have the substrings that would be followed up like a, a zero length um, bit string that would be followed up with other bit strings that could trigger it in a useful way. Well, you only really need um, like almost any. So if you have a zero length bit string followed by any two other bit strings. That should be enough to catch it, because in that second one, it's only going to allocate the space for that next bit string. And then that second one is necessarily going out of bounds. Um, so it really just takes those three starting with a zero size. So that does feel to me like a fuzzer could hit that. Oh, I don't want to say that a fuzzer couldn't hit it. I'm just saying that... Like, the, it doesn't seem overly it's, complex. It's an input... Yeah, I'm just saying that it's an input that isn't like super trivial for a fuzzer to generate. Um, now, you kind of touched on this a little bit when you were talking about like um, the fact that this is an Apple fork. And I wanted to get into the history a bit here because it is a bit interesting. Um, Project Zero found or thought that this bug might be a bit suspicious because it was introduced in 2001 as a memory leak fix, but only into the Apple fork um, because this ASN1 parsing code comes from Mozilla. Um, but Apple forked it and and uses their their own version. Um, and like this code, the way it was introduced could never really work. Um, it only really serves to give this great corruption primitive, um, because I think beforehand like this was just dead code. Um, so yeah, it, it just doesn't really make sense in the context of the parser. So they found that a little bit suspicious, wondering like, hey, maybe is this like a really subtle backdoor that was introduced? Um, but they did look into the commit history a bit further, um, and they speculate how this could have happened. Um, and they think that Apple thought that Mozilla had missed handling the case of an empty bit string um, and thought that was, you know, a, would be a memory leak. Um, so they tried to add support for parsing those empty bit strings and to clean it up properly. Um, but they didn't realize that Mozilla did end up handling that case. It was just handled through code that might not seem related uh, at first glance uh, because they were using like the state pending field. So they were doing checking on the state uh, more so than like the individual uh, uh, substring that was being parsed. Um, so yeah, Apple tried to fix it, not knowing that Mozilla had already handled that case um, and they just didn't consider all the nuances. So yeah, like we've said, subtle bug um, and Z pointed out, like Ian Beer said, he probably wouldn't have caught this on a code review, and uh, I'd be foolish to think that I'd be able to find something Ian Beer couldn't. <laughs> so, pretty yeah, incredible I mean, bug. All around. You need to keep so much in mind to actually find this one. That yeah, that's kind of sure. why I would lean towards fuzzing actually having found it, uh, because it is such a difficult one to have found through that manual review. Yeah. Um, so like Z said, there is a lot more detail there and, and some nuances. Um, you can check out the the Google post if you're interested in that. It is a bit of a tough read, though, um, because, well, it, it's not because it's uh, Project Zero's fault or anything. This is just a really complicated bug. And yeah, even when you're reading a write-up of the bug, you still have to keep a lot of things in mind. Um, so yeah, it takes yeah there are some diagrams to help, though. Because it's kind of messing with that, uh, the state machine inside this ASN1 parser, like within the parsing engine. So you need to understand what it's trying to do and what it's trying to keep track of to really get yeah, where the bug is. Yeah. All right. So we'll get into our next topic here, which is a use after free in the PHP engine, uh, detailed by Adepts of HexCC. Um, and this was used as part of a challenge to escape the. PHP disable functions and open baster sandboxing. Um, so this is assuming an attacker has PHP code execution. Um, this wasn't using a zero day exactly, but instead they found a, a type confusion uh, slash use after free on the bug tracker um, in the set error handler function, which was an enabled function, so they could use it in the context of this challenge. How it works is a little bit weird, and I'll pull up the POC for those that are watching. Um, but basically, it's similar to some of the old school JavaScript bugs and even some of the Windows bugs that we've covered in the past, where you'd be able to ca cause like a type confusion or a state confusion in the callback. Um, that's pretty much what's happening here. Um, so the POC will first allocate a string variable, which is just like an A character um, into my var, um, and it'll try to append an array to it with concat function. Um, 
Now, in, in the PHP internal engine code, it'll try to convert a value that's being appended to a string um, if you're trying to append to a string. But for certain objects like arrays or whatever, it's it's not going to be able to do that. So it'll just error out. Um, the other thing that the POC does is it sets up an error handler that gets triggered when that error fires. Uh, and that error handler will switch out my var from a string to an integer. The problem is concat functions still assumes that my var is a string uh, or whatever the original type was, and it's still live, uh, which is both kind of a type confusion and a use after free because later on, it'll try to do some cleanup on that string and destroy the result um, in the error handling. Um, but it doesn't know that that string or object was already cleaned up when the error handler reassigned a new value to the variable. Um, so that's the use after free situation that gets abused here. Um, they can get a freed object to overlap with some other arbitrary object you can set up in the handler. Because of that, you can get a pretty vast array of primitives that you can use. Um, the most notable one that they touch on first is the fact that you can overlap a string with arbitrary contents um, that will be used in the cleanup code uh, to derive an arbitrary free because your string that you allocate will take the slot of a, uh, a Z-Val, which is an internal PHP object to track like uh, strings and, and things like that. So by getting this overlap, you can control the, the Z-Val you know, pointers and other things that are in that object um, and get an arbitrary pointer freed. Um, now, obviously, arbitrary free is really cool and really useful, but you have to have a pointer to free to know like what to free already, uh, which means you need some kind of info leak, uh, which leads into the other primitive they derive, which is basically instead of overlapping a string that uh, has a pointer to free, they just overlap a null string. Uh, so in Instead of appending to a string with an object, which is invalid, um, in this case, they append directly to an object with an integer or, or whatever. Um, now, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because this is getting into some PHP engine internals that I'm just not that familiar with. I'm assuming what happens here is because they're using a null string, the cleanup code will uh, run. And the code that would usually give the arbitrary free primitive, because it's a null string, I'm guessing they have a null check. It'll just skip that code. Uh, it won't free the pointer. But then later on in the cleanup code, it ends up writing a pointer into that overlap string. So you can basically set up a string that overlaps there and return it in this error handler so that um, th you know that string gets smashed or overwritten by the cleanup code, and you can leak a pointer. So you have an info leak and an arbitrary free. From there, it's, uh, it's a little bit more trivial to derive some further primitives. Um, they build arbitrary read write by setting up a helper object with some inline properties. Um, and after after that, they can smash pointers for those properties to whatever they want to read and write um, and use the accessors to actually perform the read and write. Um, this will sound very similar to those familiar with browser exploitation and some of the tricks there with faking JS objects and messing with inline properties. Um, with, P with the PHP engine here, it's a very similar type of exploitation, um, which is part of why I really liked this exploit chain is it reminds me of some of the older browser exploitation stuff that uh, I dabbled in. Um, when they have the arbitrary read write, basically what they do from there is they scan the heap for the basic functions table, um, which is this table used by the PHP engine that contains a mapping of function to handlers. Um, there they target the system function for obvious reasons. So they use the system string as an egg. They go egg, egg hunting for it, searching for a pointer to it, basically to find that entry in the basic functions table. And then once they have that pointer, they can use the arbitrary write to smash an anonymous function handler that they set up to make it call system instead. And that evades the disable functions filtering and, and breaks out of the sandbox. Um, there was a bit of detail there that I skipped over, and there's a lot of background info on the PHP engine between this post and the post that, was, uh, that they referenced because they based their exploit strategy off of a previous exploit that was documented by Black Arrow. Um, so you can kind of check those out if you're interested in attacking the PHP engine. But really, like I said, I just love this because it's cool to see some of the old school browser tricks being reused somewhere uh, like the PHP engine. Yeah, I mean, as a... Um... As an attack, I figure I will call out if you're, if you're kind of listening, like... You know, in PHP, you're already able to run code. Um, 
you know, if you're if you're providing all of this PHP trying to create an exploit, you're exploiting the PHP engine, you're really just going from user code to user code. So it's kind of worth pointing out that something somewhat unique about the PHP ecosystem is that this does run in a lot of shared environments. Um, there are a lot of shared hosts out there that provide PHP hosting where they'll use something like disable functions so you can't call arbitrary system things. You can just execute PHP within a bit of a sandbox. So this is ultimately getting around that sandboxing. Um, and that's where the exploit comes in rather than being really about... I mean, you do gain code execution, but um, technically I think these are generally just called uh, disable function bypasses. Uh, because that's the security boundary, I guess, in PHP rather than code execution. Yeah, it's a little bit interesting because... Like, it, it is kind of a hard ask to expect an attacker, well, in many scenarios, to have um, code execution directly in, like, PHP, be able to run arbitrary PHP, which is why the PHP maintainers don't consider this a security bug, um, and they they don't consider a lot of these memory corruption issues security bugs. Uh, I don't really agree with that, because, like Z said, there are situations where that sandboxing is being relied on in a security context, um, but for whatever reason, PHP maintainers just... I guess don't really agree that disable functions as a security boundary. Um, so yeah, I mean, part of the uh, point of this post was to highlight that like disable functions and, uh, and open baster are not like the best sandboxing you can hope for. Like you kind of have to do some additional isolation and set up on your part. If you want to allow people to run or you're s supporting the ability to run potentially attacker controlled PHP code. But um, yeah, when it comes to PHP, what they consider security issues and what they consider a security boundary is really weird. Um, so it, it is interesting from like a privilege escalation perspective, because like you said, you're technically not gaining any additional privileges. You're still user code, but you could bypass the some of the sandboxing mechanisms. So yeah, yeah. it really just takes a case where you're actually in that scenario. You're in like a shared host, which... I mean, on one hand, I want to say, like, most PHP deployments aren't going to look like that, but most are. Most are going to be, like, your random WordPress, but most that you're going to encounter in, like, a corporate environment or something probably are not running in this sort of shared environment, where when you have PHP code execution, you have code execution, and you don't really have to deal with this. I, don't know, I think it's still a nice bug to look at. Like, it's a good exploit chain regardless of that aspect, but... I did kind of want to shout out, like, it is an interesting um, attack surface when it comes to PHP. As Sarsak mentioned, this makes me want to write a fuzzer for PHP. I mean, yeah, from what I've seen with PHP, with, like, the mailing list and some of the topics we've covered, is uh, it would probably be fruitful to do that. Um, and it would be, it would be kind of fun, because it would be similar to fuzzing JavaScript engines, but probably easier. Um, because JavaScript engine security is moves pretty quickly. Uh, some of these attacks we're seeing in PHP, like I, I kind of used that word old school earlier. That's because these types of bugs are mostly dead at this point. Uh, a lot of JavaScript exploitation has moved to like some of the newer and really complicated components like TurboFan and WebASM and, and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, it would be a, a fun exercise for sure to write a PHP engine buzzer like that. Yeah, could be. I mean, there's also just a ton of bugs already existing that, as far as I know, they just haven't fixed. Yeah, they just um, don't fix them. Won't fix Yeah, <laughs> I mean, because I, I kind of get it on their side. Like, if they don't want to treat disable functions as a security boundary, I'd say, you know, uh, deprecate it and don't offer it because it is mistaken as a PHP, or <laughs> sorry, as a security boundary. But, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time PHP devs have made decisions that I would disagree with. PHP disable functions feels a lot like uh, user account control for Microsoft. It's kind of in the same situation where it is a security boundary, but they don't want to acknowledge it as a security boundary. So. It's not a very good security boundary. Yeah, that too. But, I, I mean, it does stop kind of the, uh, you know, basic just throw everything at the wall and see if it works type of attacker. Um, 
who isn't really going to be writing their own PHP exploit or getting into the internals of PHP. Yeah, it it can stop like script kitty types, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, we'll get into some research here. Um, so another security things in Linux post was put out for 5.10. And there's a few things that I wanted to call out here just because I found them interesting. Um, the main thing uh, that I'll talk about first is the setfs removal continues uh, subline. And yeah, so setfs has been removed for x86, RISC-V, and PowerPC architectures. Um, this has been in the works for a while, since 2020, I believe. And uh, what setfs does, um, for those that no are not familiar with it, is it's basically responsible for setting the user land address space boundary, or it can allow overriding of the uh, address space boundary, which is pretty important um, because that's going to be used and checked whenever there's data that's being copied into the kernel. Um, so whenever you have like a copy from user or something like that using one of those APIs. Um, and this was a fairly popular, you know, Thing to attack for exploits. Uh, it was a pretty popular exploit strategy. You would smash the address limit if you had like an out of bounds write or an arbitrary write, um, and that would give yourself a more accessible arbitrary read write from user land using something like pipes or something like that, uh, where you can just pass kernel pointers in directly um, for for read write. It, it was very useful, and it was also the strategy used in the bad binder exploit I wrote up in 2019 uh, 2020. If anyone remembers that, um, but yeah. For x86, it's now gone for uh, 5.10 and higher. Um, and I'm guessing it'll be removed from more architectures as time goes on. Another thing that uh, I thought I'd call out here is there is now official support for uh, ARM64 memory tagging, which we've talked about a few times before. Um, it This will mainly be useful for both mitigation purposes and hardware-based uh, address sanitization. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty important that memory tagging support was added. I don't know how long it'll be before we really see it being used by many devices, but the fact that it's officially supported in there is is a pretty big deal nonetheless. Yeah, and I think, um, uh, or at least I'll shout out also um, the UBSAN stuff, which if you're unfamiliar with UBSAN, uh, the undefined behavior sanitizer effectively causes crashes on undefined behavior in code. So as you can imagine, the kernel does take advantage of quite a few undefined behaviors within C. Uh, so having it crash whenever it does one of those is a bit of an ask. Uh, but having it crash is letting them start working on actually fixing out or getting rid of all of those, having fixed so they can start actually enforcing that. Which, I mean, I think, you know, new projects actually running that from the get-go wouldn't be a bad idea when it comes to security. Um, but I could understand why that is a huge undertaking to get to that uh, with an active project or with a sorry uh, project with a long history. It's definitely worth calling out because we've talked about some things in the past, uh, like some talks and whatever that talk about memory corruption issues that are introduced by the compiler because code is being compiled. That's technically undefined behavior. And as time goes on, um, you know, people want code to be faster and faster, so optimizations get more and more aggressive. And a lot of optimization passes that are introduced into compilers will take advantage of um, situation, like, they'll take advantage of the difference between defined and undefined behavior. Um, so something that's undefined, they might optimize out or um, do some other weird optimization with, which, you know, from the code perspective, you would never expect, but the compiler is doing something weird there and that introduces a memory safety issue. Um, so yeah, removing behavior or code that triggers undefined behavior is a uh, positive and will be more important, I think going into the future. Um, I don't, I don't know why there's so much like undefined behavior code in the Linux kernel. I guess it's because back then in the nineties or whatever, um, it was like, you know, performance hacks and stuff like that, which, are not really needed anymore. So yeah, there is a lot of retroactive work going into that, but uh, yeah, with UBSAN now being enabled and, and fuzz with syscaller, those will be, you know, more easily dug up and can be taken out a bit quicker. So yeah, there, there were some fixes that landed for that in 5.10 as well. 
there were some other things in here that uh i i don't know they weren't too interesting to me but they are you know relevant um they had some like improved internal checking of file contents and network rng improvements things that definitely matter but yeah aren't too interesting to me from a security perspective so yeah i like seeing the rundown of what's being done um i'll admit since uh the kernel has gotten on its much faster release cycle. These are starting to fall behind because I think we're currently on like five. Is that five seventeen out now, or is it five seventeen still a release candidate? Either way, we're quite a few versions beyond five ten already. But five ten is at least, I believe. I think we talked about this on a recent episode. I believe it's the current uh, LTS. Five ten is LTS. Yeah. Yeah. So. Even if you were to switch to doing these with every LTS, it's still kind of... I, I appreciate these blogs. It's just nice to see the progress going on and what they're working on. Yeah. And just mentioning, since you were talking about the latest stable version, um, latest stable version is 5.17.2. Uh, 5.18 is what's in the release candidate phase right now. So, uh, yeah, like you said, moving Linux quick. kernel is really fast. <laughs> yeah. Fast moving with its versions. All right. Um, to end off the episode, we have a discussion around a question we got in Discord, which was kind of asking out a, about a message they saw somewhere else, which said something to the effect of, um, you know, kind of a doom and gloom perspective, like vulnerabilities are going to die. <laughs> We're not going to find any more. Um, if you're well, interested in g getting into security, you're too late. You've missed the boat, you know, yeah, kind of so that sentiment. I think they can kind of be some summed up i don't want to quote the actual message uh because it just rambles a little bit but effectively being summed up as cybersecurity um is one of fairly broad field but it's also fairly mature at this point there are words with almost close to zero bugs and that system network security it's already pretty exhausted there's nothing really new being found there and finding exploitable vulnerabilities is difficult you effectively need to be a master to find them. If you're starting now, you're too late. Don't waste your time. Maybe learn programming and uh, become a developer like they are. And this is from somebody that's saying they uh, worked as a reverse engineer and in exploitation for about 13 years and is now moving on to be a developer. Oh, there's quite a few things I think I want to say there. I will say up front, I disagree. <laughs> um, I On one hand, like... uh. Sorry, one of the other points they do make mention of is that as cybersecurity has matured, companies are starting to introduce security into their software development lifecycle. As things are being developed, their thing about security fuzzing is being introduced, and those are absolutely positive things, and it is cutting down on the number of bugs out there. But it's the security people that are involved with doing that fuzzing on looking at the crashes, triaging the crash, writing new fuzzers, new sanitizers, all of that getting involved there. So the work's changing, but there's still security work to be done. Um, and I don't think it's too late by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, even like 10 years ago, some of the vulnerabilities that are being hunted right now weren't even really known about or thought about yet. I think a really easy example of that um, is uh, request smuggling. Yeah, it technically did exist back into the uh, late 2000s, I believe. Uh, but it really was um, more recent research that has brought that about into something new. I mean, yeah, it's not the binary stuff as we're talking about with this, but like, it's a type of attack that has come into kind of modern use, and now people are looking for it, whereas before, nobody was really thinking about it. Um, nowadays, I mean, you see a lot more talking about the use after free, for example, now, than you did 10 years ago, where it was still largely a lot of overflow. So things shift. I don't think you're necessarily too late if you're just getting started now. But they, they do spot on a few things, like network security... In a sense, I think you can argue is somewhat of a solved problem in the sense that, you know, keeping up to date patching uh, and perimeter security are kind of things that are already understood and provide a high degree of security in general. Um, that's not at the AppSec level. AppSec is a bit of a different beast there. But I mean, on a whole, I, I just disagree with uh, the entire sentiment and the idea that you should just go be a developer because it's too late. 
So there was one point I particularly focused on, um, and I replied this in Discord as well, but I figure I'll cover it here since we're talking about it. Um, and that is the emphasis on zero bugs part. I kind of disagree with that because if you look at some of like the major projects, like let's say Linux kernel, since you know we were just talking about it a little bit and we cover it quite a bit on the on the podcast. Um, IOU ring is a new subsystem and it's easy to think like, okay, new subsystem security is a lot more prevalent in people's minds when they're writing code. Now it's probably going to be really secure, right? No, you look at syscaller, there's probably been like what 30 or 40 unique vulnerabilities that have been found in IOU ring since its development um, in the last couple of years, like bugs are always still getting introduced. You're never going to enter a scenario where bugs are just not happening unless, you know, um, there's a major shift to like memory safe languages or something, but even that I think is, you know, we've talked about that before too, and that's not really a going to solve everything. Even that um, you have other types of issues that exist there. Um, exactly. Like memory corruption might die, but there's still going to be bugs. Um, I don't even think memory corruption is really going to die too soon. I mean, if everybody were to switch to a safe language, that definitely reduces the attack surface substantially. So I mean, it can, like, yeah, bug classes die over time. Um, that's fine. You know, things move on. Security re researchers find new things. Um, they did call out a little bit about APTs and red teamers are only finding attacks that, like, are never going to be done in the real world. And, I mean, considering the type of bounty episodes we've had with very stupid bugs being found in the real world, that could easily be exploited by anybody, like all the idors out there. I, I mean, I, I can't even find a good way of agreeing with that sentiment. Like, there's a lot of bad code. We can talk about some things that are really security conscious, like Chrome, like the like the Linux kernel, even Windows kernel. They actively take these defensive steps, but there's also just a lot of bad code where they're not taking these things. Their security has not matured. Yeah, it's easy to only focus on the cutting edge. And to some degree, like, that's reasonable. Like, that is where you benchmark where security is at. You know, Apple is sure. kind of um, the leading thing there. But like you're saying, like, the cutting edge is not the only thing that exists. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is, like, I was talking about it earlier. Like, I don't think bugs will disappear. I do think exploitation will continue to get harder because it has continued to get harder. Um, and, you know, since I just brought up Apple, I mean their mitigation game is super strong and every year uh, it gets harder and harder to exploit Apple products. I mean, hell there was a iOS kernel ex or kernel bug, sorry, that was, that's been known about for a little while now. Uh, and there's been some, it's been interesting following the iOS jailbreak community because they've been trying to work on a jailbreak for iOS 15 for like weeks now. Uh, and I, I still don't know if it's, it's, it's been finished because this post exploitation is just so difficult on iOS. So, I don't think Vuln research or like finding bugs is really going to die anytime soon. Uh, I do think exploitation will get harder uh, for memory corruption type issues. Um, and we have a discussion video that kind of touches on this a little bit. Um, it's a little bit old now. I guess we did it like a little over a year ago at this point. Um, but our video there was kind of based around this premise that like um, the meta might shift and memory corruption might end up coming to a place where it's, it's too difficult or it's not viable in a lot of cases. Um, but even if memory corruption dies, which like Z said, I don't think is going to happen super soon. Um, you still have logic bugs, um, which in their own way are even more powerful than memory corruption is because logic bugs are usually a lot more stable to hit. Um, and they can grant you powerful capabilities too, like the iOS bug that we covered, I think last episode, um, which was a sandboxing escape through Objective-C um, and uh, NSXPC. So, yeah, I mean, I don't really totally agree with the doom and gloom take on cybersecurity and the fact that it's just going to, like, die as an industry or something. Um, I think there's a lot of nuances, and it really depends on the target you're looking at as well. Um, and while, you know, some bug classes might die and the meta might shift, it's not really going to go away, so... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Things change. Um, you know, in 10 years, I think a lot of, like, security engineering, um, any offensive security job, it's probably going to look a reasonable degree different than it does today. 
that's just the nature of the beast. Um, I think there's still going to be more for cybersecurity individuals to do. Um, in a sense, we're constantly trying to, um, at least if you're working uh, you know, with the company, except you're constantly trying to push yourself out of a job, in a sense, by making them more secure. But at the same time, that security, um, or having security is part of the software development lifecycle. You need people to actually be doing that security. It is partially the engineering. Part of it is doing those regular assessments, and you need individuals doing that and finding those bugs before they go live or as part of that development life cycle. It's not getting rid of people. Um, it's just, you know, making maybe it is making bounty hunting harder uh, if you're not on the inside with that. But I, yeah, I guess it really comes down to, you know, the industry changes but I don't think it's about to disappear. You also kind of have to factor in the context of like what angle you're coming at it from, because you, you have security in kind of these two different buckets. You have like offensive security where you're researching maybe an external target. Uh, you're doing bounties or something like that. Um, and in that sense, like it, it is getting harder and you don't want it to necessarily. And then you have the defensive side of things where you are actively working on, you know, um, integrating fuzzing into a project that your company maintains, or uh, you're trying to do internal security audits. Like there is kind of the two different sides. And I think the way you look at it will depend on which side you're on because defenders have always looked at it in the way that attackers have always had it too easy. Um, you know, they have the scalability where it's a bit harder for defenders to scale. Um, and they're also like a determined attacker is going to put a lot more time than it might be possible for like a team to invest where they they're having to manage multiple products and stuff. Um, I don't want to go too deep into that because I guess that's kind of a different discussion. But yeah, I mean, at least on the defending side, security is not really going to change that much i don't think going forward you're, the the uh, the work might shift a little bit of what you're working on um on the attacking side yes it is a little bit more like doom and gloom in the sense that it's going to get harder but yeah i don't think it's going to disappear no and i don't think it's um beyond like if somebody were getting started today i think it's just fine even to get into memory corruption like, I did say in our Future of Exploit Dev video that I wouldn't bet on a long career doing only memory corruption. I, I do see memory corruption now being more of a, in a lot of positions, more of a value-added thing, where it's like, you're good at this and you're good at that, rather than just being your sole specialty. I mean, there are still people doing it as a sole specialty right now, but thinking about a long career, you know, there's that aspect, but I mean, it's definitely not too late to get into it. Um... They kind of draw a distinction of development versus cybersecurity, and it's like, you know, go learn a language. I personally think you can go ahead and learn a language and go into security, too, or learn a programming language, get into security. It's, it helps quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing serious security, I feel like being a developer is a bit of a prerequisite. Uh, maybe not like, you know, a full stack developer that's doing everything or something, but you probably should, you know, have a little bit of uh, background in development to it, it would it would go a long way. So, yeah, at least if you're doing AppSec, it helps. Yeah. And uh, Sarsec mentions IoT embedded devices seem to be lagging behind. Yeah. I mean, that's another industry you can point to. We've covered a lot of IoT type bugs on, on the podcast and a lot of the time they're meme bugs. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, that's kind of the distinction between like looking at the cutting edge, like browsers and kernels and stuff, hypervisors, and then looking at other types of products like IoT where, you know, the security isn't that mature yet. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good show, too. All right. But uh, unless you have anything else you want to add, Z, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up the uh, the episode. Um, no, not really anything to add. Um, I will say we did. Uh, we just tossed this discussion on to the end of this episode largely because we didn't have a lot of interesting exploits for this week. Um, we've done it a couple times. I'd be interested to know if anybody has any feedback, if you guys actually appreciate these discussions, or would rather we just found other exploits to write up. Um, you know, I'd welcome any feedback coming out on, over Discord with that, or however you want to reach out. 
uh, just let us know if you actually like these discussions or if we should focus more on something else. All right. Uh, with that said, that's basically everything that we have uh, for this week. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. The um, bot will be up on we YouTube. Got, sorry, we just got a chat, or sorry, a question out of uh, chat. Um, yep. And I do want to talk about, would you say the same for web hacking? Trying to find the ones automated tool seemed already found could be really hard sorry i'm i'm reading this live um our logic bug is going to be the ones researchers should be looking for in the future when it comes to web application um i mean we say logic bugs as a way as kind of a catch all for like every sort of bug that is basically as catch all for every bug that doesn't cause a crash um, is effectively how we're using it and i think in some contexts you can have a bit more of a limited definition over what a logic bug is um, that's a, like, a lot of the web is that, like, if you kind of take that idea, like, SQL injection, all of that, um, a lot of the bugs just come down to the developer having some incorrect logic at some point. Um, that's how we do have bugs like the, uh, deltas or diff disagreements between, like, a front-end, back-end server, so the HTTP desync attacks like that. Um, I would say, like, the web hacking, we're going to see that same sort of trend of things do get more difficult, more complicated. Um, it's kind of interesting with the web because there's a lot more creativity on the vulnerability side, whereas in exploit development, you know, it's a lot more of creativity on the exploitation side, whereas on the web, you find a vulnerability and that kind of tells you how to exploit. Like, there aren't a lot of different ways to exploit a SQL inject. You might query different things, but ultimately... They're always kind of the same idea, whereas exploit dev, you know, we have the same core sort of vulnerabilities a lot of time, integer overflow le leading to whatever, or stack overflow, like buffer overruns leading to whatever, um, and then it gets more creative. So that is one of the differences between like the web hacking versus um, the binary side of things, but ultimately like. As with the web, just like we saw between like 2000 and 2010, started seeing SQL injection becoming less common. Um, obviously, between 2010 and 2020 or 2022 now, SQL injection even less common. Like the types of vulnerabilities are changing, but there's constantly these new vulnerabilities being found in the web realm, like constantly new things. There's just so much going on as technology changes, cloud, everything. So many things going on there. There's just so much movement that... I would say it is the same, like, in the future, um, you know, it's, we're still going to need the web security researchers. In fact, I'd say that's maybe more important than memory corruption, in some sense. That, that could be fighting words, so. <laughs> uh, I've, a lot of the topics that we've seen in, like, the, the web hacking space the last, you know, year, whatever, um, has been like authentication flow stuff. So, you know, some auth flow takes, like, doesn't consider that some other page can access this value or can change this value. I don't know. Um, it's kind of specific to what's being looked at. But for that reason, like, yeah, there is the automated scanning tools you can use for web to like, you know, find inputs and, and variables that can take you know, maybe an XSS payload and try it and see if it works. Um, but a lot of the more interesting bugs that are in like the authentication flows and stuff, I you can't really find those, at least not easily in an automated fashion, because you have to consider um, all the different parts of the authentication flow and what's going on there. So I don't think those those bugs are really going to change or die anytime soon, because some of those authentication flows get really complicated by necessity. Um, and when you have complexity, that's when you have those types of bugs arise. So, yeah, I mean, nobody, or it's very rare to have complex code without any bugs. And web apps just keep getting more complicated. Yeah, they've gotten a lot more complicated than less complicated. That's for sure. Uh, as we, as you look at the space. All right, but uh, yeah, with that question answered, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, the VOD will be up on YouTube and Spotify and other platforms tomorrow, as always. Um, feel free to follow our Twitter and join our Discord to, you know, discuss anything either on the episode or any other thoughts you might have. Um, we have some cool discussions in, this, in the Discord sometimes. 
And uh, yeah, with that said, we'll see you all next week.